All right, so in this video, we're going to look at some questions where we have to apply Fleming's left hand rule. So, start off a straight wire carries an electric current at right angles to the page. Uh, the black dot in each diagram shows where the wire passes through the page. So, the wires are all going into the plane of the page. Which diagram shows the correct pattern? So, around a wire, we get what we call concentric circles. Uh, so, the field lines mustn't have a free end, so they must form complete circles. And the further away from the wire you get, the weaker the field gets. And that's clearly shown by option D. A looks like it would be an electric field of some kind, and I've no idea what B and C could be. OK, so the diagram shows a current carrying solenoid or coil, that's just a fancy way of saying coil, and the position of a plotting compass. OK, so uh, we've got the indication of the direction of current in the coil. So you can see it's going, sort of, if we look from the end B, it's going sort of anti-clockwise around in loops. Um, OK, so the plotting compass is used to follow magnetic field lines. On the diagram, draw in one magnetic field line which links A and B, both through the inside of the solenoid and round the outside of the solenoid. And then we want to mark the direction of each part of the field line with an arrow. Uh, OK, so information I'm going to use here. So imagine yourself sitting at B looking at the coil. From your perspective, you would see current going around anti-clockwise. And that means you are sitting at the north pole end of the solenoid. It's a really useful rule to use. Uh, if you were at A facing the coil, it would look to you like current was going around clockwise. So you are at the south pole end. And the other thing we need to use to draw this is remember field lines go from north pole to south pole if they're traveling outside of the coil. And a, a useful way of remembering this rule that I've just used is shown by these two diagrams down here. So if you draw an S and you let the ends of the S, you see if we have a clockwise current, you can see it kind of the arrows point around in an S. If you have an anti-clockwise current, you can see the ends of the N indicate we're going anti-clockwise, so you're at a north pole end. That's what I use to remember this. So anyway, back to the question. Uh, we would get a loop that looks like this. Uh, I should have done a little bit better to make it actually go through A and B as was asked. And then we can add directions. So we said B was a north pole end. So our outside the coil, the field is going to be going uh, from B to A and inside. Therefore, it must be going from A to B like this. OK, so the diagram shows the result of a similar experiment with a current carrying straight wire. Uh, draw on a magnetic field line starting at C, mark its direction with an arrow. So first of all, we can draw a field line on. Uh, we're going to get a, essentially another circle around there. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to use the right hand corkscrew rule. So if you take your hand, make a thumbs up sign because the current is going upwards. So your thumb should be in the direction of the current. So my thumb is pointed upwards and you can see your fingers are going around from uh, and ending up going around anti-clockwise here because uh, you follow the direction of your fingers and so we get a field that looks like this okay so explain why the line from c would never pass through b uh, simply put magnetic fields can lines can never touch or cross over one another that's a rule you can always apply they're never going to do that and the reason they don't do that is it would indicate an infinitely strong magnetic field and that's because the distance between the lines tells you how strong they are so if two lines were at the same place with a separation of zero that would indicate an infinitely strong magnetic field and theor in theoretically if you had an infinitely strong magnetic field every magnetic thing in the universe would either be attracted would end up being attracted or repelled by it which is a bit odd so what would be the effect on the strength and on the direction of the magnetic field of reversing the current without changing its value so if you don't change the value or the magnitude of the current, you're not going to have any effect on the strength, but it will change the direction of the field. It will be completely opposite. If you increase the value without changing its direction, we get the opposite. So the field strength would increase if you could make a bigger current, but its direction not affected at all. 
So a wire carries an electric current between the poles of the magnet. This causes a force that pushes the wire upwards. The poles of the magnet and the direction of the current are both reversed. Which arrow now shows the direction on the force on the wire? So any of one of those changes on their own would have given you a force in the opposite direction. Because we've changed both, we're going to end up with a force in the same direction. So we can actually work out which way the current's going. If we've got our field line go from north to south, so from right to left, we've got the force upwards, that's our thumb. So the current here must be actually going into the page, which is actually what an X shows. If you see an X like that, it's a current into the page. So that uh, follows Fleming's left-hand law. If we reverse the direction of the field and reverse the direction of the current, that's going to again give us a force upwards, so we can check our answer with Fleming's left hand rule anyway. So a student wraps a length of fine wire about a wood block and hangs the block between the poles of a magnet, as shown. What is seen to happen when the student passes a current through the fine wire? Well, the block is going to start to rotate, and depending on the direction of the current, that will tell you which way it will rotate. And why does that happen? Well, we've got the moving charged particle's velocity, the current essentially, is at 90 degrees to the magnetic field. So we're looking at the current in the vertical sides that we're talking about here. And so if you have that scenario, they're going to experience a force because of the interaction of their two fields. So because those forces are going to be in opposite directions, because let's say on the left-hand vertical side, the current is going upwards, that would mean on the right-hand side, the current's going downwards, and currents in opposite directions give you forces in opposite directions, so, and they both act to rotate it in the same direction, uh, or produce a torque, if you like. Um, name the device that uses this effect. Well, that, that's an electric motor uh, that uses this effect. So this question is about electromagnetism. Michael is investigating how a short length of copper wire can be made to move in a magnetic field. And he's doing it using this apparatus. So we've got a battery, a switch, uh, some horizontally clamped copper rods, we've got a thick copper wire, and we've got a magnet. Okay. He places the magnet so the wire is midway between the poles. Okay. So he's made some observations, so he can only make the copper wire move along the rods if the switch is closed and the poles of the magnet are above and below it, not on each side. So we're going to need to explain those two observations. So to have a magnetic force, we need two magnetic fields. Uh, it's the same for any non-contact force. For an electric force, you need two electric fields. For a gravitational force, you need two gravitational fields. For a magnetic force, you need two magnetic fields that are interacting. And in order for the wire to have a magnetic field, you must have moving charged particles or a current. And therefore, you need a complete circuit so that there is a current flowing. So the switch has to be closed. And then, when the charged particles move perpendicular to the magnetic field, they experience a force perpendicular to both the field and their velocity. So in the position shown with the poles above and below, the field is going down vertically. The current is sort of coming across through it. So it experiences a force along the copper rods. But if you had the poles either side of the wire, that's going to create a force in the vertical direction. So it's not going to move it along the copper poles. It'll make it either jump up or down, depending on how you align them. So the diagram shows a simplified view of a model electric motor. The coils between the poles of a permanent magnet. Uh, so before we actually go into the question, let's actually use Fleming's left-hand rule on this. So the conventional current is going to be going from A to B because it comes out of the positive side of the battery and then come from C to D back to the negative terminal. So the field goes from north to south. Conventional current is going from A to B. So you can see we'd end up with a downward force on side AB. If we do it for CD, field is still going from north to south. The current is now going from C to D. So you can see your thumb is pointing upwards. We've got a force that way. And they're both acting to rotate it in that what anti-clockwise direction from this perspective. Okay. So 
using your ideas about the forces on conductors, explain why it starts to spin. Uh, so we've kind of seen that already, but let's put it into words. So current and magnetic field lines are perpendicular. That's true specifically for sides A, B and C, D. Uh, the B, C and D, A are actually parallel to the field, so you, they don't experience a force. So the coil isn't going to experience magnetic forces down on AB and up for CD. They're in opposite directions because the current is in the opposite direction in those each of those wires. So that's why we're going to get the spinning. We've got those magnetic forces both rotating the coil anti-clockwise when viewed from end AD. What would happen if the terminal is reversed? Well, it's going to rotate clockwise or rotate in the opposite direction because we've changed the direction of the torque by changing the direction of the forces. Uh, so if you get current in the opposite direction, the magnetic force is in the opposite direction. And that, like I said, produces the torque in the opposite direction. Okay, final question, looking at commutators, or a split ring commutator to give it its full name. Explain how a split ring commutator allows the motor to continue to spin. Drawing forces on the diagram may help you with your answer. So, the wire at D changes the terminal the battery is connected to every half cycle. So for half a cycle, it's connected to the positive terminal. Half a cycle, it's connected to the negative terminal, depending on which wire it's connected to. And that means the current is going to be going the opposite way around the coil every half cycle as well. And you can see the, it actually changes the connection when the coil is vertically aligned. So like D's at the top or A's at the bottom or A's at the top and D's at the bottom. That's when it actually switches over. And that keeps the turning effect in the same direction the whole time. And that means it continues to spin in the same direction. If we didn't have a commutator, what you'd end up with is a motor that kind of oscillates back and forth. So it would spend half the time going clockwise, then it'd go back anti-clockwise and just keep flip-flopping, which might look kind of cool, but isn't very useful if you're trying to drive anywhere. Um, and that completes this question or, or these questions looking at Fleming's left hand law and the motor effect.